alcohol nucleophiles behave much like water in the presence of ketones and aldehydes, but there is an added twist here in that two equivalents of alcohol can react with a ketone or aldehyde to form what's called an acetal product. And that's the focus of this video, the formation of acetals from ketones and aldehydes and alcohols under acid catalysis. Now first, let's talk a little bit about this acetal functional group. I'm actually gonna zoom in on it because this is worth pointing out. Some important structural things about this uh, species are worth pointing out. First of all, notice the acetal contains two CO bonds involving a common carbon. That carbon that shares the two CO bonds in common is the carbonyl carbon of the starting ketone or aldehyde. And so an acetal is at the same oxidation level as a ketone or aldehyde, both plus two, right? Plus one for this CO bond and plus one for this CO bond. So no change in oxidation level has occurred here. It's sort of a net substitution process. However, two equivalents of alcohol have incorporated themselves into the acetal and a molecule of water has been liberated. So there's a bit more going on here than just a nucleophilic addition process. And so the mechanism gets a little bit long, but is going to draw on the pattern, the mechanistic pattern of acid catalysis that we've already seen. And we do need an acid catalyst to get this reaction to go. And this H plus in brackets in a reaction scheme, you may see it as a specific acid like H2SO4 or HCl or just the generic H3O plus, something along those lines. We do need a Bronsted acid in there to get this reaction to go. It works with a wide variety of alcohols, and quite commonly the alcohol is, is quite cheap and abundant, something like methanol, ethanol, ethylene glycol. If our carbonyl substrate is precious, we'll typically use a cheap alcohol. There are cases where the alcohol or diol, if there are two hydroxyl groups in the substrate, is the sort of precious side, and then we use a cheap carbonyl compound like acetone or something along those lines for acetylization, this formation of an acetal from an alcohol and a carbonyl compound, ketone or aldehyde. Ethylene glycol is an important one worth pointing out because this is a diol. It contains two hydroxyl groups within its structure. And these two hydroxyl groups can both react with a single carbonyl carbon to form a cyclic acetal. We'll see examples of that in a wide variety of reactions um, in the ensuing units. Okay, so let's talk about the mechanism of acetal formation from a ketone or aldehyde. It's acid catalyzed, so it starts with our acid catalysis dance. Put a proton on, do the business, and then take that proton off. So first, the acid protonates the carbonyl oxygen. And here, I've just added a quick reminder that we're gonna avoid alkoxide intermediate. So proton transfer from the acid occurs first to avoid an alkoxide when the nucleophile adds. And that is the business step. In comes the alcohol. The alcohol donates a pair of electrons to the carbonyl carbon. Pi electrons head up to the carbonyl oxygen, and we end up with this species, as well as the conjugate base of the acid, which is floating around at this point. Now, to complete the catalytic cycle, if you will, we need to get HA back, and we do that by deprotonating at the positively charged oxygen atom, the alcohol oxygen, the nucleophile that just added, gets deprotonated, and that gets us to a neutral product and regenerates HA. Now, a word about this neutral product that we've arrived at. What has happened here is the net addition of OR2 and H, the elements of the alcohol, HOR2, have added across the CO double bond. This looks a lot like hydration. It, it is essentially acid catalyzed hydration. The mechanism is identical. It's just there's an R2 group being carried around by the nucleophilic oxygen rather than another hydrogen. This structure is known as a hemiacetal. It's called a hemiacetal because the structure retains an OH group in it. It doesn't have two OR groups. Notice in the acetal, I've got two alkoxy groups connected to the carbonyl carbon. In a hemiacetal, I have only one alkoxy group and the OH group still retains the carbonyl oxygen. The carbonyl oxygen is still in there. The reaction continues. And we'll look at the, react, the rest of the reaction mechanism on the next slide. I did briefly want to mention, though, that you will see hemiacetals in molecules where we, can, we have a carbonyl group and a hydroxyl group well positioned to undergo cyclization. In a biochemical context, this comes up most commonly 
with the carbohydrates, which contain a ketone or aldehyde group, more commonly an aldehyde, although ketoses containing ketone groups also appear in biochemistry, and a ton of hydroxyl groups. And when a hydroxyl group intramolecularly attacks the ketone or aldehyde group, you can end up with a hemiacetal. So glucose and fructose and other monosaccharides, carbohydrates that contain one sugar unit essentially are very, very commonly drawn as hemiacetals. The hemiacetal under the acidic reaction conditions can react further, and this is ultimately because it can be pronated and kick off a molecule of water. So under these acidic reaction conditions, protonation of the hemiacetal occurs to give a structure like this, and we can see there's a water molecule built into this structure that would love to take a pair of electrons with it and depart as an H2O molecule. That essentially occurs with a little bit of an assistance, a little bit of a kick, if you will, from the OR2 oxygen in what we could label a beta elimination step, right, since the leaving group is beta to this nucleophilic pair of electrons on the oxygen. And this generates something that resembles a protonated carbonyl. So this is a good moment to pause and compare this structure with OR2 plus to the protonated carbonyl way back in the hemiacetal formation right here. These two reactive intermediates are highly, highly analogous to each other. And this carbon is profoundly electrophilic. We can imagine a resonance form. I won't draw it, but you may want to pause the video and draw a resonance form of this with positive charge on this carbon. So another molecule of alcohol can get involved at this point and engage in nucleophilic addition to that carbon, giving this structure. And finally, to close the catalytic cycle, the conjugate base of the acid can come in and deprotonate. Again, this could be any old reasonable conjugate base under the reaction conditions, H2O, something along those lines. And the result is a neutral product in which the OH group in the original hemiacetal has been replaced with another OR2 group to give the acetal. So at this point, I want to also point out that this is acid catalysis. We put the proton on, some things happened, and then the proton was taken off. And the business here, this two-step business of loss of a leaving group followed by addition of a nucleophile, actually resembles the SN1 reaction. And there's a deep connection here between SN1 and this electron flow. The leaving group leaves, and then the nucleophile comes in, just like in an SN1 reaction. So we can think of this as acid-catalyzed SN1 occurring at the electrophilic carbonyl carbon. And the acetal is the final product here. And when we take a ketone or aldehyde and treat it with typically solvent quantities of the alcohol, there's no stopping at the hemiacetal. The hemiacetal proceeds spontaneously all the way to the acetal. So the acetal is the final product here. So the overall mechanism starts from the carbonyl compound. We get protonation, addition of the alcohol, and loss of a proton to get to the hemiacetal. The hemiacetal gets protonated at a different position to create an H2O leaving group, which departs. Another molecule comes of alcohol comes in and adds, and a final deprotonation gives the neutral acetal. 